Today is October 28th, uh, 2016, and I'm Ann Gallivan, coordinator of uh, Lessons of the 60s, a project to document social justice organizing it in Washington, D.C. from 1960 to 1975. Um, today we're, we're interviewing Eric Martell. Eric is a career teacher, now retired, who has lived in Washington, D.C. since 1961. So Eric, what brought you to Washington, D.C. in the first place? Um, pretty much the same thing that brought you to D.C., which was uh, going to Georgetown University. Um, I went, uh, uh, I was admitted into the School of Foreign Service, uh, the class of 65, um, and I originally wanted to go into to the Foreign Service. Um, uh, I remember being very excited by a series that was on television, which I forget the name, but starred Cesar Romero, who was a, you know, a, a diplomatic uh, courier and got into all kinds of wonderful adventures, could speak many languages, and so well, this is for me. Foreign Service looked like so much fun to so yeah. many of us then. <laughs> well, um, you came in 1961 then. Right. Um, when did your social justice gene kick in? Was this before you came, or did you become active only in college? Um, I, I think there were little traces beforehand. Um, um, I mean, one, one little incident I recently recalled and shared with some of my high school uh, chums. Uh, I went to a Catholic Irish Christian Brother High School, and in 1960, um, of course, that was Nixon running against Kennedy. And I remember the uh, principal saying on the way out of, uh, as we were getting ready to board the buses, be sure to tell your parents to vote for that Irish Catholic um, uh, Jack Kennedy. So when it came time to vote, I voted for Nixon. Because the idea that, somehow the idea that he was telling me to tell my parents how to vote. I mean, my father wasn't even Catholic, which wouldn't have sat very well with him. Um, that, so that, there was a little revolt there. Uh, but, but when I, my first two years at Georgetown, I really, I was, I felt completely overwhelmed by, by the level of academics, by all the smart people who were getting all these high grades and, and I just felt lost, you know. Um, but I think probably mostly, uh, I was probably most influenced by, by fellow students, particularly Walter Drowdy, whom we both knew very well. President of our class. Right, he was, yes, uh, uh, in the, senior, the senior class in 64-65. Uh, uh, um, and uh, he always kept needling me. He even kept needling me after we graduated. Uh, and uh, uh, because uh, at Georgetown, if you remember, there was also very strong uh, Young Americans for Freedom uh, organization, which of course, uh, these were the people who were the, you know, the young bloods who were behind the whole Goldwater movement. Uh, for president in 1964, and uh, so I was influenced by them. Of course, you know, that was the whole period where, you know, communism was a, a threat we grew up with as something to re, you know, that had to be defended against, and as a result, um, uh, some of their arguments made sense. Um, and. Uh, one, I, I was also influenced uh, um, by, uh, th probably through Walter, um, by Father Richard McSorley, who was uh, the campus priest activist, um, who uh, was involved in all kinds of community activities. Uh, uh, we had an or there was an organization called GUCAP, Georgetown University Community Action Program, where he uh, took us to meet people, uh, African Americans, really. I mean, and of course, as 
you and I both recall, there were hardly any African Americans at Georgetown. <laughs> Right, and that included Africans, not just African Americans. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I think we, he, there was even a, a tutoring program that had been yeah. set up at that time UCAP as well. UCAP is a big service organization <coughs> with lots of different projects, and you were part of the Civil Rights Project there, right? Right. As well as the tutoring. The tutoring part, would you do the tutoring also? I, I, I have a vague recollection of that. Yeah. Um, I don't remember, I don't remember too much. Um, and as far as the civil rights, I don't want to exaggerate the civil rights aspect. Um, uh, I know that we, there was a letter writing campaign at the time of, of the uh, 1964 civil rights bill. Um, and so I, I, I helped to write letters and uh, encourage others to write letters. And of course, there were lots who were opposed to that. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, in the spring of our senior year um, of 1965, there was the, uh, the, uh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act had been passed, I think it was in the summer of July of 64, just before the 64 election. Then, of course, the Voting Rights Act, 65, that came up, uh, of course, it was still the Voting Rights Bill, and that, that of course, um, reached a crisis point uh, with the Battle of, Sel of Selma Bridge um, in early March of 1965. And uh, again, our friend Walter went down as soon as, uh, you know, as soon as things began to happen, he went down there. His picture was in Time magazine. And then he called, you know, he called us to come down. And so several carloads of Georgetown students joined the march in the, the last march. two days. The big march at the end. At the end, right. Um, Selma, Selma, uh, Selma to Montgomery. I mean, it was just at the point where the marchers were maybe 10 miles or even less outside of uh, Montgomery. Um, so we were there maybe, what, two or three days. Um, and uh, we were put up in, uh, in, in homes in the black community. Um, I remember we stayed at one home. Uh, Mr. Ziegler owned it. He was apparently a contractor. Very beautiful home, but the street was not paved because the, uh, the, the, t uh, the city fathers didn't see the necessity of paving the streets in some parts of the black community. Um, and uh, well, I remember from, uh, from the film Selma, one, one memory that I recall from from being from being on the last legs of the march, were as we were walking down the highway, the the, you know, the sides of the roads were lined with African Americans who were s sitting there, waving in a friendly way, but clearly they were not ready to to get up and join. Obviously, the intimidation that they faced were so real. Um, and uh, so that was a, a very, you know, indelible and memorable experience. I mean, Martin Luther King spoke. I don't remember that much what he said, except that uh, um, it was just sort of a feeling of uh, being part of a larger community, a larger effort, you know, for making things better. Um, so... Um, uh, you know, I was, we, we had discussed whether or not, um, you know, and of course, the 60s was, of course, marked by the war in Vietnam. And, of course, it was sold as an effort to, again, stop communism uh, in, you know, uh, and it was a, it was the, the liberal version of how to stop communism. As a matter of fact, you might even say the liberal Catholic version <laughs> because uh, uh, the Catholic, you know, influential Catholics from, um, um, uh, was a big bishop in New York, uh, uh, Cardinal uh, Spellman, Spellman. Um, right. and the Kennedys 
and uh, and so on. They were all, you know, part. This was the alternative. This was going to be, you know, organizing the uh, um, uh, ag through agricultural reform and so on. It was going to build support for this uh, promising new leader, uh, Mo Dinh who was Catholic and <laughs> who had spent. Uh, uh, at before he immediately before he became president of the Republic of Vietnam, the South Vietnam was in a Catholic monastery in New Jersey, and uh, so he anyway. So uh, all of us men faced the draft, um, and growing up in in you know the 50s and 60s one anticipated one expected that uh, you know you would go into the military um, now when I was at George Georgetown had both Army and Air Force ROTC and I did not join either um, I can't remember exactly why um, but uh, in by the time I reached my senior year I was really fed up with academics. <laughs> it was always a struggle and I wanted to, I figured I, I really wanted to do something more physical and you know I was certainly facing you know the likelihood I would be drafted um, and you know there was this Vietnam you know which was just sort of a little little thing you know it, I mean it was before us it was before us. I mean, I remember Madame Nu, who was the so-called first lady of South Vietnam, the sister-in-law of the president, visited Georgetown. And, um, I think it was... It, it was two weeks before her husband was assassinated and right. three weeks before the Kennedy assassination. Right. Uh, and Father McSorley urged us all go to go to picket her which I did, but I didn't know anything about Vietnam or where it was. I just did what he said. <laughs> but there was about a half a dozen people who picketed her, but several hundred inside the hall that, that applauded her. Interesting little historical note. It all happened, all right. month, all that happened. You know, right. Well, and also, ironically, he was assassinated on All Souls Day, which, of course, <laughs> big, big feast in the Catholic Church. Um, and... Uh, uh, of course, nowadays we know that there was probably a pretty, pretty good, good chance that the United States at least was passively, if not somewhat surreptitiously and actively involved in in that in that in, in that event taking place. Um, uh, he was uh, anyway. So um, I, I decided I wanted to join the army and. Uh, Join as an officer, uh, better than as an enlisted man, and uh, so I knew that the army had a program called Officer Candidate School. So I inquired about that, and this is maybe January of 1965, our senior year, and it told me, well, no, Georgetown has ROTC. You didn't take ROTC. You, you know, our OCS is for people coming up through the ranks, okay? So, you know, I don't know. So then other things were going on. I was, had classes. We went down, to, several of us went down to New Orleans for um, Mardi Gras. And then that was just a, that was so, so Mardi Gras was very late that year because it was only about a week later that uh, events broke out in Selma. So, you know. Twice I was driving down into the South for the very first time, seeing the South, you know, driving through Philadelphia, Mississippi, where the three civil rights workers had been killed the year before. Um, I, with New Jersey license plates, I made sure that I stayed well within the speed limit. <laughs> and um, Anyway, so it was around March of 1965, then all of a sudden, right around that time, I get a letter from the, I guess from the Selective Service saying that, uh, oh, well, um, you're, you're now eligible to uh, apply for OCS. Well, of course, in retrospect, we know that uh, by that time, decisions had been made to expand the war, 
and they would need more cannon fodder. So, so I signed up, and uh, you know, uh, we graduated on June the 6th, and on June the 24th, my father drove me down to Newark Airport, and I flew, the first time I flew in an airplane, down to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, eventually Fort Gordon, for infantry basic training, and then advanced infantry training, and then in um, early November, I guess it was, whenever, um, to Fort Benning, where I started infantry OCS, a 24-week course at the end of which you get a gold bar, you're an officer and a leader, okay, which it would be miraculous because I've never really been much of a leader. Um, um, so anyway, um, I tell this because around the 10th week, and I meant to mention this, I should have mentioned this to Marcus Raskin when I met him again. Marcus Raskin, by the way, had been to my class once. So he probably didn't remember. Um, uh, we had to give uh, a, a book report on a military topic, a military issue. So um, I had not really studied much of military history. Um, so I got a book by the name of Street Without Joy, written by Bernard Fall, who was, of course, co-author with or co-editor with and author with uh, Marcus Raskin of the Vietnam Reader, which they put out uh, about 64, 65, okay? Um, so by that time we had enough, you know, indoctrination and so on about, you know, the strategy. I mean, of course, everything, all of our training was being focused on Vietnam. That, that was the likely hotspot, of course, it could have, I could have wound up going to the other two places, which were not hotspots, which were Germany or Korea. But, you know, the likelihood was you go there. And, uh, of course, to just jump back, it was in also in March that the first regular U.S. military units went into Vietnam, okay? Uh, the Marines first, uh, Da Nang. Um, before that, it had been U.S. advisors. Okay, about 15,000, uh, plus a lot of civilian advisors through the University of Michigan Agricultural Program, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, well, one of the, one of the thing, one of the, one of the, uh, part of the, 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 the military doctrine that we were learning was, of course, the whole concept of air assault, which involved using massive numbers of helicopters, moving, you know, moving troops in very quickly where the enemy would not know where you, you know, no, would not be expecting you, and be able to remove people quickly, and as well as um, removing the wounded, the injured, and the dead uh, from the battlefields and so on. And that, the, the, uh, the, the ability to move quickly with these helicopters, plus naturally having total control of the air with, you know, Air Force and, um, and, and as well as Navy air, air support, would be an absolute guarantee of victory. However, when I read this, you know, I read uh, 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 Bernard Fall's account of, of the French um, effort in, <coughs> in, in Vietnam, um, it, it, it was really about, the street without joy was Highway 1, which runs from Hanoi to Saigon, uh, and how, you know, how, how, the, how, the, uh, how the French were, you know, ambushed and, you know, just ran into all kinds of obstacles and so on, so, okay. Um, it struck me that even with helicopters that it would not necessarily make the big difference. And I pointed that out in my report. Well, that, that immediately you know, uh, alienated me from the TAC officer, that's what they call them, TAC officer, in charge of each group of, of people who were 
you know, uh, of what we were called uh, officer candidates. Um, and uh, uh, in addition to the fact that, I, you know, there were some things, some leadership areas where I was not very strong and so on. And, uh, and I was not good at some of the very important military uh, skills such as spit shining shoes, spit shining your floor so you could read your name tag from the floor, uh, all, these, all these things. And uh, I suppose probably a little ADD was thrown in there too. <laughs> anyway, so uh, and finally things hit a crisis point for me. Um, about two or three weeks before graduation, this would be like my 22nd week, okay? By that time there were about every, uh, I think after the sixth week, the 12th week, the 18th week, there would be, you know, special evaluations and people would be kicked out. And already some people who had been kicked out from the 6th, maybe even 12th week, had been sent to Vietnam and a couple of had already been killed. Uh, because by that time you have these big battles already by the fall of 1965 and then early 66 and so on. So they told me, you know, and then so I think the issue, one of the issues was that I had to lead a hypothetical assault against what they called the aggressors, which were, you know, American soldiers with funny looking uniforms and hats that looked like Roman legionnaire hats with a big wooden uh, plug at the top, you know, and they, well, they said, well, Martel, you, you know, you got about half of your platoon killed, you know, so <laughs> you, you're not, you, you're not, you're not officer candidate, you're not officer quality, you know. Well, it was, that wasn't, uh, so, you know, you're going to be, you're out of the program. Um, so that was kind of depressing, and so I figured, well, you know, I know where I'm going. Uh, so I said, well, I thought to myself, well, I'd like to have at least some fun, and uh, maybe, you know, get a little more training, you know. The more training, maybe the better chance I'd have of surviving. Um, so I volunteered for airborne, which is parachuting, you know. Um, and so, and, and it just happened to be that the airborne school was just right, at, literally across the street from where, where the officer candidate school was located. That's a three-week program. Um, so. That was, no, that was no sweat, five jumps and you're qualified. And that means then you're gonna go to an airborne unit. And then I realized, of course, well, gee, now, the airborne units, the 101st, 82nd, 173rd, they're the ones that are getting shot up. <laughs> I'll, maybe I could use a little more training. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, well, heck, why not? I'll, I'll apply special forces, okay? So I applied. And uh, I even extended my enlistment. See, the enlistment for OCS was two years. I added, not, maybe I have to add a little bit, you know, so that, you know, you know, right now I only have about eight months left. They're not gonna take me, you know, f to train me f to, you know, to become a civilian. Uh, so uh, I added six months. Um, so, uh, and so that would give me about 14 more months left and so on and, um, and so I was accepted, so after, because you have to go to airborne first anyway. So I went to that, and then I went into training. And that training lasted until, uh, uh, I, think that, I think there was some sort of a, an unexpected delay. But anyway, I was, I was trained as a Morse code radio operator, which was kind of strange because they didn't use Morse code in <laughs> Vietnam. You know, they were all, you, you know, you use voice. Um, <laughs> and, it, and we were being trained on these radios that they used, you know, with the par partisans that used be, uh, in World War II behind the enemy lines and all of that. So we learned all about radio propagation and all of that and so on. Um, and uh, so by the time I was finished, I had about 11 and a half months and you needed 12 months in order to be sent over to Vietnam. Or maybe it was 13 months including, you know, a, 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 a two week leave or whatever. Um, so I got sent to a unit, you know, based in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and, well, I, which is where the training was, and uh, so that's where I stayed, you know, and so we, you know, 
jumped out of airplanes. We went uh, hiking in the woods of, uh, of uh, Linville Gorge, you know. Um, uh, that's, that's where I found out about the chestnuts, you know, because I always had my bird book and my, my tree book with me, and I discovered all these, these trees, the uh, chestnut trees, uh, that were coming up, and I, I had known that they had been wiped out by a, a, uh, um, a rust or a virus, um, and, but I saw that, you know, they would come up, they, they, were, they, were, they never grew more than about 10 feet high, so I, I you know, I, that was kind of interesting. And many, many years later, I discovered there was actually a foundation that, is, uh, that was formed to try to, you know, uh, overcome the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the virus or the, or the whatever it was, you know, that, that was killing the chestnut trees through, you know, um, uh, mixing, you know, mixing them up with uh, Asian chestnuts and so on and so forth. So then I, I thought I'd get, I, 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 I thought it was a neat, a neat logo, you know, and so I, I got that. I, I discovered that, and it was only about five or six years ago I learned about it. Anyway. Um, so, you know, by December of 1967, uh, that was shortly after the, you know, the, the demonstration surrounding the Pentagon, um, I was out, you know. And you never had to go to Vietnam. I didn't have to go to Vietnam, you know. I, I got to go to Key West, Florida for about three weeks and learned to become a scuba, scuba infiltrator and all of that. But, <laughs> But I didn't. Uh, Who knows Morse code? I, I, I didn't have to act. I didn't have to go. I didn't have to face. You know, the trauma of killing or being killed or maimed or maiming or any of that. So you know, it was like a, a glorified Boy Scout experience in many ways. You know, uh, so um, and then, well, so during the time I'm in, I'm in in, in the army. Um, I kept up correspondence with some of my friends, especially with Walter, and Walter would send me all, Walter by this time, he had gone to the University of Madison, which was of course the hot spot of SDS and all, and then he went, then he was, he, he went and worked in a, uh, in an African American school, uh, Miles, Miles College. Miles College in Alabama. In Alabama, um, and he was writing me, and he would, he often would put stickers on the envelope, on the outside of the envelope, you know, end the war now, you know, and so, you know, and mail call, which was often, you know, like we'd be out on the rifle range or somewhere, and, you know, then, then the mail clerk would come with, you know, the, with the mail and, you know, read off, you know, okay, Martin, you know, Jones, Smith, whatever, uh, Martel, yeah, one of your communist friends wrote you again, you know. <laughs> and, and so he, you know, I was, you know, still defending some aspect, you know, because I, I wrote Walter, and and then he was, you know, he always, you know, challenged everything, you know. Uh, anyway, so when you got out, you came back to Washington. Well, when I get, so I got out in 1960 uh, in in December of '67, about two weeks earlier than mine. I was supposed to get out on Christmas <laughs> Eve, but I got out two weeks early. Came up, saw Walter, and my plan always was. Um, that I was going to go to spend six months in Germany and then six months in France um, to better, you know, to, to increase my, improve my knowledge of these languages. Both of my parents are from Germany, and so, and there was, a grandfather had, my one grandfather had left a little bit of money so I could go to a school there. So anyway, I went then to, to, you know, to Germany for about four months. Uh, I studied at the Goethe Institute in the southern Germany and lived on the estate that my uncle, who was a priest who ran a, a series of, of uh, charitable homes for, um, uh, uh, for, ch for sick children, asthmatic children, and so on, uh, in the foothills of the Alps, you know, and I lived there, no one spoke any English, so I was really a, f a full immersion situation. Before I left, I had applied to um, Columbia Teachers College, the famous Teachers College, and also uh, Walter suggested, well, you know, they have this new program over at Trinity College called an MAT program. Why don't you apply there? So I thought, well, why don't I'll do that too. And because I, I was accepted to both, um, 
And an old family friend, I remember him saying, which echoed what our, our, our beloved uh, Georgetown professor Quigley, you had him too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Had, had, had spoken very pejoratively about teachers' colleges. Okay, but the MAT program was a little bit different. It had sort of the theory and all of that, but it also had content, which made sense to me. Okay, um, and I so anyway, so I was accepted to both, you know. And this was like after about four months in Germany. It's like while I was gone, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and also uh, Robert Kennedy. Um, and it was about a week and a half after Robert Kennedy was assassinated that I returned. I returned because I kept getting these hysterical uh, messages from my mother saying, they keep calling us from this little college in, George in Washington saying, you know, is he going to come or not? We want to hear from him. We want to hear from him. Well, of course, this was, you know, when money was flowing. So I accepted and I went to Trinity College, you know. Uh, all expenses paid plus two hundred dollars a month stipend, which was a lot back then. Okay, um, and so and then you know you study for a year, and then the second year you finish up your you know your requirements, and you're also placed in a school. And I was placed at Cardozo High School. Well. When it, it just so happens that Walter was, had broken up with one of his uh, lovers, and he said, okay, uh, why don't we get a place together, okay? So we got a place, we got a place, and it was on the corner, uh, it was on uh, 1737 Riggs Place, on the corner of Riggs and uh, 18th, right adjoining Bill Trainer's runaway house. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so Bill Trainer, who had also gone to school with us, okay, he was a little bit older because he had been in the Army before he came to Georgetown. Um, and uh, so, you know, Walter, uh, I, I guess I lived there with Walter for about two years, you know. That's when I discovered, you know, and my, you know, here I am, I'm what, 22 years old or something like that, and suddenly you know, I became aware of the gay world, you know, and Walter, of course, was gay. I mean, he never said anything. It's like, oh, that's why Walter goes out at night, and, you know, and that's why these different guys come in. Oh, duh, you know. <laughs> And I remember, you know, because I, because I had so much, I had so, such a great admiration for Walter. And by, by that time, he was, he was teaching at Marie, what later became Marie Reed, was, was Morgan School, uh, I think it was called then. Um, and then I felt when I just realized, because I came across a couple of his friends, you know, going at it, you know, and, I thought, and, 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 and they said, hey, you know, Eric, come on, wake up, you know. And I felt embarrassed for him, you know, that, that I knew, I don't know, you know, it was a strange emotion, you know, I wasn't put off with by the uh, uh, notion of being gay, because uh, to me, anything that Walter did couldn't be bad, you know. <laughs> I mean, I suppose that's how I rationalize things, but whatever. And um, uh, so anyway, I lived there, and then, and then um, I got engaged to this uh, fellow student at Trinity, and we went, and then we got an apartment together, and so on. Uh, the apartment we got actually was over in uh, on Woodley Road, in right off Wisconsin Avenue, near the cathedral. Okay, that's when, at, at that, that was the time when, if you remember, if you went to the cathedral, it was at the, filled with all these, you know, um, stones that were had been carved, you know, awaiting to be added to the finishing of the construction. Um, so, uh, and so I became, when I came to Washington, so this, when I came, came to Washington, it was uh, in July of, or June of 2000, uh, July, June of, of, 60, of 68, okay? Um, by that time, um, of course, that was, the other thing that I missed by by not being in the army and, and also uh, by being out of the army at the time was the Tet Offensive in 
uh, in, in late January, early February of 1968, I I where one of my best friends from the Army was, well, actually he wasn't killed there, he was killed a little bit later. But. I want to ask you, just insert here, because we got from 61 to 68, which is, I came to Washington about the same time you did. Can you compare what it felt like to be here in the early 60s with then what it felt like to live in Washington, D.C. after the riots, Do you, I, which would be 68? Right. It's a very different atmosphere, but can you describe what those felt like to you? Um, well, I know that, you know, like a, you know, we, as students over at Georgetown, we had very little contact, you know, with the uh, um, black community other than through projects like GUCAP. Um, I remember we did go once, I know Wal Walter arranged this, maybe, I don't know if you were involved in that, we, a bunch of us went to Uline Arena to hear James Brown. And I remember being so amazed, you know, that, uh, and we were elected about 15 uh, Georgetowns. So we were about the only white people in the, uh, in, uh, you know, who were there. there. You were there? there. Yeah. And uh, I remember being amazed that, you know, people just getting up, you know, and dancing right in the middle of, you know, the concert. You know, it wasn't, you know, like, you know, going to the opera or going to the movies where people are just sitting and watching. You know, people were, you know, this was an engagement. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I, I don't know, the, 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 the sense was that this was a very distant place. You know, the black community was a very distant place, of course. There were, you know, Georgetown had been largely black in the 30s, but then re renewal and, and pushed out except for little spots here and there. Um, as, as a matter of fact, where Wilson is located, Deal, they used to be uh, an African-American community going back to the uh, uh, post-Civil War period, okay, which had been cleared away um, in the 19, when they built Wilson and Deal in the 1930s. Um, and uh, except for the Rose School, which was for, that was the black school, which in the, in the ironies, jumping way ahead, in the ironies, of course, you know, of the last few years, closing down all these schools, mostly in the eastern part of the city, and the Rose School then was renovated as an annex of Deal, okay? So, you know, if you can come across all the way, all the way across town to Deal, you know, you might be able to still be in this, you know, in, in this, you know, as as the mayor says, uh, uh, a deal for every, every part of the city or something like that. Anyway, so um, when I went to, Car when I started at Cardozo, I mean, this was, you know, the inner city, you know, I mean, the, what was called inner city, which was, of course, code for poor black communities, um, although not everybody in those communities was poor, but, you know, it was, you know, you had a sense of danger. I mean, the year before I started, the principal, an assistant principal, had been shot and killed on the front steps of Cardozo. Um, so, you know, there was this, you know, this sense, and, That's what know. I was getting at about 1968. Uh, you know, I, I was here all through that. But there was a sense of, a palpable sense of fear all summer and, you know, for the next couple of years. After that, there was high, high street crime, too. It was kind of scary. Washington, D.C. overall was kind of scary in 68, so even if you knew the city pretty well. Yeah. Um, um, and like I said, I was away during, you know, during, during the actual events, you know, with the National Guard coming in and uh, even, uh, I think even the 82nd Airborne was here, too, as well. Um, and so I, 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 didn't, I didn't see all of that, um, but I mean, I did give you one letter that Walter wrote just two days after, uh, on, on April the 6th, two days after the assassination, describing what it was like, and uh, uh, at one point he says, yeah, and all the white people are leaving town, you know, <laughs> something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, and also, I, let me say, I grew up in a town in New Jersey, Paramus, which was, uh, there, were no, there were no black people there. There were at one time, um, um, but uh, 
Uh, I mean, even I, later I saw my, my parents, uh, um, they bought a grave plot and it said, you know, only people of Caucasian background can be buried here, the George Washington Cemetery. Although there is a Jewish cemetery on another part of town, but still, I mean, the, the sense of, and, and growing up in a place like that, you, you just didn't, you, you don't think about what you don't, you don't think about what you don't think about. You don't think about what you don't see, and so on. And so the, these questions never, you know, the issues of race were sort of distant, you know. Um, and so then, you know, now I'm going to be teaching in a school that is all African American. The building itself had previously been the white, the white school, one of the white schools, Central High School, uh, in during this period of segregate of legal segregation, um, then it had been transferred to uh, the what they called the colored section um, of the school board of education uh, in 1950, which was four years before uh, Brown and uh, and uh, Bowling versus Sharp, which was applied the Fifth Amendment to the ending of segregation and uh, school segregation in D.C. Um, so, I mean, you know, it, 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 so there was a whole s adjustment of, you know, uh, you know, he, here you have a school where most of the teachers are African American. Many, uh, some of the older ones had been there since the days of segregation. And here are all these young white kids coming in, you know, who are going to save the schools, you know, going to save education. And so, for that was, excuse me, that was also about the same time that the teacher corps had, was spreading out into Washington, D.C. schools. So you must have been teaching with some of those other idealistic young oh, yeah. teachers, right? Yeah, there were several of them uh, yeah. at our school. Um, and uh, it was probably coming from a similar federal budget yes. or whatever. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, ma many of them stayed, you know, m m I would say most of them stayed for only for a few years, maybe two or three years, you, you know. You were at Cardoza for quite a few years. I was at I remained at Cardoza for 16 years. What did you uh, teach, history? Um, history. I was, well, in the general, the, the umbrella category is social studies. So I taught uh, world history, U.S. history, U.S. government, um, and then uh, uh, I, I also, I think the last two years I even uh, uh, did what, what I, what I fancied was a bilingual thing with a little bit of Spanish that I knew, you know, because by that time, by, by the mid-80s, then there were uh, kids from Central America began to uh, appear in, in the D.C. schools in that area, okay? Um, so, um, anyway, so that, so I, so that, that that's where I was, on, and then I went to Wilson High School where I was for 25 years. Did you, did you like teaching at Cardoza? Uh, well, I enjoyed teaching there. Um, and, you know, I, I tried to involve students with, you know, various, you know, you know activist activities, you know, uh, um, the, the home rule stuff that was coming up in the anti-war, naturally. Um, uh, you know, civil rights activities. I mean, we had some teachers who were, one teacher in particular was very well connected to everybody in the community. She knew Stokely Carmichael. Uh, she knew, uh, of course, she knew Marion Barry. Um, you know, Marion Barry, of course, in those days was the head of Pride Incorporated on 16th and U, you know, um, and that became his launching pad for mayor. I mean, well, for school board, and then later council, then mayor. Um, and, uh, well, and then, of course, um, I became very active in the Washington Teachers Union. Um, so that was simultaneously, you know, that was, you know, that was part of being both an anti-war activist as well as, you know, another vehicle for activism. Um, the teachers union had, acquired, had gotten its first 
recognition as, as the bargaining agent uh, in 1968 um, as a result of a big walkout and, and, and were able to, because they, they had to influence uh, the people on ca uh, the, the Congress because of, of course there was no independent school board yet. Um, and then, uh, and then in 1972 was the first teacher strike. So there were two teacher strikes, one in 1972, and the, uh, the second one was in 1979. Um, there were around pay issues around, but, but also around uh, supplies and, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, well, um, s really support for educational programs in the schools. Um, and these were strikes that, you know, in retrospect, compared to the level of activism that it, within the teachers' union in the last tw 30 years, um, where, where thousands of people were involved. I mean, it's still, you had to organize it. But one of the things that, I could, that really, I think, played an important role was the fact that th a number of people in and quite a few of the teachers had been either actively, but mostly passively, even just in their hearts only, supporters of the civil rights movement. Yeah. And so this created, so the teacher, organizing the teacher union, um, organizing the strikes was really tapping into this sort of well of activism that existed among um, the majority of people in, you know, who were teachers at that time. Um, and I remember, but by that time I had, through my, through my uh, anti-war activism, I had sort of become a, uh, uh, I had become close to and then I joined the Socialist Workers Party. Um, which was very actively involved in building um, large demonstrations. The idea being that the large demonstrations that can then pull in people who um, were not necessarily uh, even so sure about civil rights or sure about, as by this time, women's rights and other issues, but who would come together around this one issue, that that would become you know, the pressure point, you know, for ending the war. Um, so, uh, so they were, you know, so there were a whole series of anti-war marches and so on uh, and so on. And there were some, I remember there were, the, the Socialist Workers Party was very active within what was called the National Peace Action Coalition. In Washington, it was called the Washington Area Peace Active Action Coalitions. And the two main leaders were old time leftists, uh, um, Abe Bloom and Helen Gerwitz, okay? Um, and they had been active in the, uh, and the attempt to organize federal workers and so on. Um, and then the other group was the uh, People's Coalition for Peace and Justice, which was mostly influenced by people who were around the, what was left of the Communist Party, the old Du Bois clubs and the Young Workers Liberation League. And they tended to be more multi-issue and so on. Now I remember one little incident, uh, because it involved Julius Hobson, um, where uh, the people from the other organization accused the Social Workers Party and the, uh, the WAPAC of being racist because, because um, anti-racism was not a primary, you know, focus of their go uh, goals, you know. And so, um, and so I, you know, and, and the Washington Teachers Union had always endorsed all these demonstrations, you know, through a, through a formal process, you know, of, of submitting, of a, actually passing a resolution and then using the resolution to reach out to other organizations such as um, other unions, 
other uh, you know ministerial organizations. There were you know, lots of or there were some networks of, of ministers that were active you know, around these various social action issues, okay? And could be drawn in, you know, the theory, you know, around the theme of money should be spent for, you know, people's needs rather than fighting a distant war. Um, and uh, Julius Hobson would almost, you know, he was all free, he would frequently come to these demonstrations. And I remember he always, there was one thing he, he always said, you know, talk, he would talk about coming from Alabama, you know, where, uh, where, where the, where the police would rather shoot an N.I. than a rabbit, you know, and uh, <laughs> that always came up in, in, every, in, in his speeches. But anyway, so at this one point I remember um, uh, talking to, uh, you know, uh, ask Bill Simons, you know, what do you, you know, but they're saying that this is racist. And, yeah, the, uh, Bill Simons, president of the Washington Teachers Union from, um, very early, you know, I guess, well, long before I joined, uh, until probably in the, in the 19, early 80s. Uh, um, and um, so we wanted to head off this thing because obviously we wanted to involve everybody in, in these anti-war activities. And so, um, you know, and so I mentioned to Bill, and, and Bill said, you know, yeah, this, you know, he supported, he supported the union, uh, the, the anti-war action, you know, it wasn't racist. And then I said, well, now, you know, we need to reach out to other people and so on. And so, um, and then, you know, he, uh, I think, I, if, if I remember correctly, that he wrote a letter to Julius, and I brought it to Julius, and I asked Julius, you know, um, would you support this? This is what they're saying, and so on. And his, his, his response was something along the lines of, you know, who the hell said that? You know, you know this is ridiculous. So, um, it, he, he, I think he, his view was that anybody who was working for the, a good cause should be supported. Yeah. That's how I remember it. Um, and uh, so, uh, well, let's see. The uh, well, I, I'm just sort of going on, but uh, just. Uh, did you have any other? Well, I, as you're talking about these things, I'm looking at the, your collection of buttons on the floor. You've been involved in so many mm -hmm. things, anti-war and teaching and civil rights. You want to show us just some of your buttons, hold them up so we can photograph them. Is there anything you want to tell us, uh, stories about <laughs> any of them? Uh, um, you've got a really quite complete set. Yeah, of well, a, lot, a lot of them are anti-war buttons and then women's liberation buttons. Um, uh, well, pick one I that Eddie can photograph, or pick a... Yeah, uh, let's see if I can... Okay. Um, let's see. Um, well, Labor for Peace, that was an organization that uh, Bill Simons of the Washington Teachers Union helped to found it, and uh, um, quite a few uh, unions, certainly by 1971, 72, um, more and more unions began mm -hmm. to come around to, to be opposed to the war, including another big one was the, um, uh, the United Auto Workers. UAW. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you also have a Veterans for Peace button there. A Veterans for Peace, yes. Um, uh, Bill Trainer and I formed a briefly, <laughs> what do we call it? Young Vets for Peace. Now we were, both of us were not Vietnam veterans, so uh, I think that lasted long enough for the FBI to notice it, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, but soon the VVAW, Vietnam Veterans Against the War, developed and of course was much more significant. So, you know, our, our little organization, you know, didn't go beyond the FBI notice. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, uh, There's some great ones down here, this white one um, underneath that. Or here? Yeah, some of those. Let's we'll see some of those. Let's see. Um, one for Marion Barry for mayor, right? Yeah. Um, well, I ran, oh, well, I mean, I, I could mention I, I ran as a candidate for school board twice uh, for Socialist Workers Party, uh -huh. mostly to sort of, you know, bring up issues that were of concern, which were, um, 
Th that was in 1973, mm -hmm. and again in 1975. Uh, I gave you one of the flyers from 75. Right. Um, and uh, let's see. So, you know, the, well, the Socialist Workers' Party was very big on not supporting capitalist candidates, you know, Democrats or Republicans. Um, and uh, it was a way of obviously trying to recruit uh, people and uh, to get out the word. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, the, the, this actually has a number of local buttons. I mean, I just picked up because, you know, somebody, I, so usually somebody gave them to me. Um, it was Barry Nevius. Um, I think he was, wasn't he chairman of the city council for about a year or two? Or maybe he was uh, John Nevius. He was, uh, he was, he was on the, he was in D.C. politics. Uh, I know he ran, I think he was a Republican. Um, and uh, I mean there are actually a few somewhat liberal Republicans still in those days. Um, What's the one at the bottom? Support 18 and 72? Is that? Oh, 1872. Well, that was the new party. Another, <laughs> another brief will of the wisp, but still the idea of 1872 um, for the voting for voting to be lowered. So actually, it was lowered then by the was the 24th Amendment. Uh, um, and uh, let's see. Um, uh, well, gray is much later. Um, let's see. I also well, um, uh, Newt Gingrich is in the news, of course, as a supporter. And, and so <laughs> the no newts is good news. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, just, I found also something you gave me the other day that I think we should take a photo of. Going back to be, you're still a Cardoza. Here's a picture you gave me of some of your students in the 70s of the, it, in Cardoza. Oh. Uh, you're standing beside them, I'm thinking maybe Eddie can shoot Right, that. this was probably around 1978, but yeah. it was the uh, Wilmington 10 Defense Committee. So uh, you had that at Cardoza High School? And so, yeah, well, we formed a little yeah. chapter there and, uh, you know, learned about the Wilmington 10 Defense Committee. Well, the funny little anecdote that happened was that uh, while I was also explaining the Wilmington 10 issues um, in my one class, an assistant superintendent walks in and starts listening, you know, and Marilyn Brown, assistant superintendent Marilyn Brown, um, and she's sitting there listening, she's taking notes, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, my goodness, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is not part of the curriculum. <laughs> to the extent that we had an organized curriculum and so on. And then, so <clears throat> after the bell rings and, you know, she comes up and she said, well, Mr. Martell, that was a very fascinating thing. The, um, do you know that I grew up about four houses down from Ben Chavis, you know? <laughs> in, in uh, no, not Wilmington, but in uh, um, another town, another town that had sort of a famous civil rights history. And so, you know, so it turned out to be okay. <laughs> um, and she was one of these people who was, uh, I think she was a teacher for maybe about a half a year, and then she applied to be a, an assistant superintendent and was rejected, and she filed a, um, a lawsuit, you know, for discrimination. She got up there, never got higher than that, but she was, she was up there for many, many years. Um, and uh, here are a bunch of, um, uh, Nixon buttons, um, uh, impeach Nixon, uh, uh, Nixon the Watergate bug, um, uh, let's see, there was, there's one, oh, Nixon, Nixon drinks Ripple uh, in support of the farm workers, okay, uh, and I think there's one about blood on the grapes somewhere, uh, um, and, uh, uh, let's see, there was, um, and then for, what was it? Uh, Free Angela Davis is there near the top. Free Angela Davis, right. Oh, well, one of, one of the anti-war activities was to get the American Federation of Teachers to oppose the war. Albert Shanker was the power 
in the uh, president of the New York City Local 2 of the, the United Federation of Teachers, which was the union local that controls the American Federation of Teachers. Um, um, but he uh, was not yet president of the AFT. Another man named David Selden was. Um, David was moderately opposed to the war, but Albert Shanker coming out of his sort of, you know, the, the pre-World War II socialists who sort of flipped when, uh, when von Ribbentrop shook hands with Molotov uh, and, uh, and, and this Hitler-Stalin pact took place, you know, they went, you know, they went from left all the way up to the right. So they were, these were the anti-communist socialists who were in support of the U.S. policy in Vietnam. And People Shanker around the, and Shanker was a part of that, right. He was part of this, this uh, group which was, you know, the group that is now still the rem remnants of the group around the magazine Commentary, okay. Um, so he opposed it. So uh, the first, I went to the, con the National Convention in 1971 in San Francisco, where we also then took a bus out and, and demonstrated outside the prison where uh, Angela Davis was being held. Um, but he would, he, because he controlled the votes of the majority members through the New York City local, opposed the resolution. We had a whole multi, you know, about seven or eight different locals around the country passed a resolution that went to the national convention opposing the war and supporting peaceful anti-war protests. Didn't pass. The following year, 72, which of course now the war is now, you know, going down very quickly, um, and, and St. Paul, Shanker released his delegates to vote their, to vote their conscience, okay? So, and by this time, you know, even in his own New York City local too, the majority were opposed to the war, yeah. okay? Um, for various reasons, but of course that was the whole idea of a single issue, is that, you know, you can be opposed to the war because of the money, because, you know, you think people should run their own affairs far away in the world, or whatever, whatever your reason, at least, you know, you're opposed. But you have unity yeah. in this one issue. That's right. Issue um, so, it, so, so the union, in, in short, the union did finally come so up. So the union did finally in 1972, in right. Um, and at the same time that it endorsed uh, uh, Jimmy Carter. Um, and, oh, then in, in 1974, this was, I think this button was, yeah, this is, this button was designed by Jules Pfeiffer. It was for the Boston, in support of the buses, the busing in Boston, yeah, okay? Yeah. Um, and, uh, oh, here's Hobson. What, what does it say? I can't read the, what it says. It says, keep the buses rolling, march on Boston, May the 17th. No, that's not Jules Pfeiffer, that's uh, Doonesbury. Doonesbury. That's Doonesbury, okay? Um, and uh, there's another Jules Pfeiffer button here. Uh, and here's a Hobson button, okay? I don't know if, uh, and here's a Wilmington 10 Defense Committee button, okay? Um, just about, oh, about three years ago, uh, Governor Perdue of uh, North Carolina issued a pardon for the uh, Wilmington 10. Um, a little bit late, but a little bit late. <laughs> but eventually it happened. Um, this was a very popular button. It's, a, it's sort of to sort of focus on you know the various uh, move, uh, the various crimes committed by the government. Milai, Kent, yeah. the killing of the Kent oh, State, yeah. the four students in the anti-war protest, Jackson, um, yeah. Jackson State College, yeah. Black College in yeah. Mississippi. Um, where the same thing happened, but didn't get yes. as much coverage, right. and of course Attica, uh, the explosion now, in Attica. Who put up that button? Pardon? Who who made that? This button? was uh, this was put up by the SWP. Yes, okay. Yeah, um, and then let's see if there are any uh, 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 Paul Robeson, uh, the Young Workers Liberation League. Uh, Josephine Butler was very close to the Paul Robeson Society, I think it was. Um, and uh, uh, this is a funny one. 
uh, oh, anti Nixon it says uh, the hand the the arm holding the axe says Nixon it says let me make one thing perfectly clear um, and then it says stop the budget cuts join the coalition for survival um, and uh, another March Against Racism in Boston, December 14th. Um, now, let's see if there's, uh, uh, did I, uh, let's see, another anti-Nixon button. Uh, an, Ameri an American tragedy, it says. Picture of Nixon. Um, out now, well, out now was, uh, was one of the, one of the themes of the uh, National Peace Action Coalition, the idea of, you know, out now rather than long negotiations and so on and so forth. And it's also sort of the theory of sort of the hard cop, soft cop, you know, that is, you know, make, make demands as immediate and as, dr as dramatic as possible, you know, but the people in power may be dallying, but that's going to push them a little harder than if you simply say, Go slow. Um, go slowly. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, somebody mentioned his sisters for Silkwood. Uh -huh. um, he had one of the early buttons. But that's one of the early ones? Yeah, because then we changed it to supporters of Silkwood so that ah. men would also wear the button. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Let's see. We got a lot of support from National Organization for Women. And uh, I see, yeah. So is, uh, now put this out? Pro probably somebody in uh, I was working. Oh, okay. I've never seen one with the women's sim symbol in the middle. Yeah. Because right. Um, yeah, I guess in those days, you know, they were still at the point where not many people, you know, some men would be a, n not so sure they could support it. Honeywell, um, that's the uh, cluster bomb units that Honeywell manufactured. Uh -huh. um, and uh, American Indian, this is well, Bicentennial, 1976, uh -huh. AIM, American Indian Movement. And let's see if there are any more that are specifically relevant. Uh, um, What's the upper left-hand corner? Is that a little girl? Um, Solidarity with Vietnam, build a children's hospital. Um, a hospital was bombed in uh, somewhere in the south. Where was that? Uh, Bak Mai. Bak Mai. Bak Mai, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, Nixon, you liar, signed the treaty. <laughs> uh, January 20th, 1970, one of the last big anti-war demonstrations just before the in Nixon's second inauguration. Oh, gosh, I um, uh, sexism is a social disease. Um, let's see. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Oh, sign now. Uh, the peace treaty, right? Yeah, the peace treaty. Okay, another out now. Uh, stop the draft. Uh, Vietnam veterans now. Yeah, that must have been from May Day. The veterans one. Yeah, I think so. I have, uh, gee, I think I have some May Day buttons. I don't know if I can find them. Um, uh, oh, th this was a very popular button. Uh, I remember I, I sold a lot of these buttons at the marches. Uh, uh, how many more? Um, um, and let's see. Uh, uh, April 24th, one of the biggest, April 20th, that was 19, April 24th, 1969. Uh -huh. um, that was one of the biggest uh, of the demonstration. I mean, not quite as big as the uh, MOBE. Well, yeah, the uh, one in November of that year was the biggest demonstration of the war. About yeah. a million people, November 69. That was huge. And then, uh, let's see, uh, um, Again, uh, the, the, this was sort of one of the ideas of, of uh, one of the organizing ideas that you know people could sort of bring their own issues, you know, fo that you know focus against organize against you know ending the war, but you can bring issues that you know you know 
that women might want to march together or support, uh, supporters of gay rights might want to walk, march together and so on. Um, and uh, let's see, this is, uh, oh, this is another big one. This was, this was a very popular button. Um, again. Uh, Peace button, right? Yeah, April 24th, uh, 69. Um, and, and then the anti-war GIs, of course, as more and more GIs yes. uh, are opposed to the war. Um, and let's see, uh, uh, gay, gay rights uh, and uh, opposed to the war. And well, I uh, want to move on now and sort of um, try to finish up. Um, you're at Car Cardoza for 16 years. You right. teach a lot of kids history. Um, then you move over to Wilson. Right. And Wilson, you had a long career of teaching, and I wanted to hear some of the, this kind of, starts to end the interview because I know your teaching there took up the rest of your active working life, right? I mean, you retired from right. teaching, but tell us about teaching at Wilson and some of the people that you brought to your classes and things, and things you did. Yeah, um, well, I went to Wilson and uh, uh, I, I had almost got, almost ready to quit teaching because it's, at, at, at a certain point at Cardozo, I reached a point where it seemed almost pointless to be teaching history because so many of the kids were, um, they were their reading levels were very low, were very poor and, and you know, there was a high absentee rate and so on. Issues which of course still exist still across us. the city, yeah. Um, and uh, I just, uh, I don't know, I, I, uh, I, it became very sort of depressing, you know. A lot of people were quitting, you know, um, those who could, you know. I mean, a lot of the younger teachers, you know, would come in, even like today, you know, with the Teach for America and so on, they come in and, and, you know, they're going to law school on the side or whatever, you know, this is just to do some community service and now, you know, knock some money, knock some of the, uh, I don't know exactly how it, what the, what the, or, what the arrangement is, but they can get some um, credit towards, uh, towards uh, t uh, student loans and so on. Um, and uh, anyway, so I, I, got, I moved to Wilson High School in 1985, and then the following year, I, 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 I well, the first year I was in there, I was, uh, I, I became the history teacher in the uh, essentially 10th grade Wilson International Studies program, um, or WISP, okay, which was sort of like a magnet program uh, for students around the, around the city could apply to, to be in this program. And, and then the following year, um, uh, the principal asked me or, I found out about this AP program and I'd never heard of before. We didn't have it in my high school. Um, and, uh, and so I started teaching that. And I was, you know, t I was faced with this, you know, the question of, well, what do we do after they teach, after they take their national exam? Because they take their national exam uh, in the first two weeks of May. All the AP exams are in the first two weeks in May, but then there's still another four weeks left of school, okay? Um, so, you know, what a lot of teachers would do is just let the students disappear. <laughs> so, but I figured that, well, this would be a, you know, because the whole Vietnam thing, you know, those of us who have lived through that period, I mean, that, that and, uh, you know, the other big movements at the time, you know, they sort of engulfed our lives, you know, and, and you know, how, how can I, you know, bring this into, you know, into teaching? I mean, I can mention, obviously I mentioned it in the curriculum, but I mean, you can only spend a, a very short period of time on, on each particular issue, but you have a, a, a long period of, 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 hi, of U.S. history from the colonial period to about 20 years before the present. So, you don't have a lot of time during the regular sequence of the school year. So I decided to um, 
I, I think the first year I, I tried to do something very eclectic, including, um, including uh, Woodstock. Um, because every student would always ask, were you at Woodstock? They wouldn't ask about the anti-war demonstration. Then I almost did get to Woodstock. You know, my girlfriend and I, we were on our way there, but, but we got caught in the traffic jam, which was about 20 miles long, and decided to go somewhere else. So we missed being at the one signal event of our generation, um, or at least what some would think. Um, on the East Coast. On the East Coast. <laughs> um, and I didn't go to, we didn't go to Chicago either, you know, uh, that was another big thing, you know. Um, but, so then I decided to do a project around Vietnam and then together with a Vietnam veteran, um, developed a whole series of interview, of oral, que of oral history questions. And I would, and so eventually what I did was, uh, I put together this activity where they had to read uh, one or two, one or two books, and uh, now this was of course before the internet. You know, <laughs> the internet really destroyed all kinds of th things because you know, it, it just the copying was just, you know, it, 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 it. You really, I don't know how teachers do it nowadays. It's very, very difficult to do serious research because I also had students doing research papers. You know, where they had to document. You know, and. Uh, their sources, annotate their sources, and so on. Um, and, and I would actually look up their, their sources, you know, randomly and check, you know, and which some parents got really upset about, you know. <laughs> what do you think, you know, uh, you know, this is, this is just high school, you know. <laughs> I said, well. But I'm interested you know. actually in hearing some of the people you had, hearing about some of the people you invited right. to your course. So, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. so then, so, so the, the, what I did was the Vietnam activity involved several things. It involved reading, it involved, uh, and I, I gave, for example, I gave out the, uh, oh, another thing that was very radicalizing for me, that helped me grasp things, was Ramparts magazine, okay? Um, as a matter of fact, there was this one essay, this one anecdote or memoir by a former Special Forces Master Sergeant, I remember it was, I quit, you know, and uh, uh, I wish I still had that. Um, but anyway, um, so they had, then they had to go down to the Vietnam Memorial, um, which had opened in 1982, and do a rubbing of someone, preferably someone who their family knew, or someone, you know, s s do some connection, a neighbor, or a church, or synagogue, or whatever, Okay, or if none of that worked, someone who, uh, and you could look it up on a book then now, of course, and on the internet, someone who died on your birthday, some connection, okay, and then do a little write-up of the person. Um, uh, and then, uh, uh, and then, you ha then they had to go, then they had to go, they had to interview people, they had to interview a Vietnam veteran, a Vietnam anti-war activist, and then, um, Usually I had a third person that they could pick, you know, someone who could speak, you know, about their, that they had strong feelings one way or the other about the war and why. So I had a whole series of questions, okay. For the military, I explained, you know, they had to, I went through, you know, what the different ranks were, the difference between Army and Marines and so on and so forth, so that they could ask questions that were a little bit more intelligent and targeted, you know, uh, and not, so that the, the, so that the person they were interviewing would not have to be spending any t interview time talking about very basic stuff, such as, you know, what the army does or what, you know, something like that. And then I also had, in it, I had some films that I showed in class. Um, one was, um, uh, from 60 Minutes, uh, no, was it 60 Minutes? Judy Woodruff, what was she, six? That wasn't 60 Minutes, that was... CBS. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. Vietnam Remembered, where, uh, no, v Me Lai, Remember Me Lai. Yeah, Me Lai. Okay, uh, where people who were soldiers who were at Me Lai and participated in the massacre, you know, talked about their experience, you know, and it, that was very heavy. Okay, um, 
then that wasn't Judy Woodruff. But any, anyway, so I had a bunch of different, but the one that was very popular and that I liked and the students liked a lot was called um, uh, Dear America, Letters Home from Vietnam, where um, letters that were written by veterans, okay, and some anti-war activist types um, were read by, by actors and actresses, okay? Um, these are actual letters, you know, and it's sort of, you know, and, and in the background, the music, the popular music of the period. So that, that was, you know, Rolling Stones and, you know, et cetera. Uh, so th that, that always, you know, really captivated. And besides, they always had to take notes on everything. <laughs> and, uh, um, and turn, you know, this was part of their credit. And then I brought in speakers, you know, I, I would just call people up, you know. So, I mean, you know, uh, and, and I, I wanted to get, you know, a cross-section of people who were, you know, the veterans, of course, and anti-war activists, okay. So, uh, um, Marcus Raskin came once, you know. Um, Eugene McCarthy, I told you, he, he wasn't, he did. He read poetry, and he was. And it was not that exciting, you know. Uh, George McGovern. I managed to get him once, you know. I usually because he was always very busy. He was at IPS for a while, and uh, if I didn't call him, it, I, I just managed to k get him, you know. At the, I think he had a, bro a break in his schedule or something, so he came once. And he was. He was. He was interesting. Um, and then uh, uh, Seymour Hirsch. Um, uh, he came probably four or five times. He was probably one of the most riveting speakers, and he never got past how he found Lieutenant Cowley, just describing, you know, he's a very down-to-earth, sort of like a, a street-smart kid, you know, from Chicago who, uh, um, he had been in the Army, so he knew a lot of the techniques of you know, how the Army worked and how to, so he was able to sort of manipulate all of this. I mean, he, and, and he would, he would say to kids, you know, uh, present them with a, um, with, a, with a moral dilemma, okay? Um, for instance, what? For what instance, for, so he, he, he finally found out that the lawyer who was representing Cali was a Mormon, of, um, uh, one of the leaders of the Mormon church, um, and he was in, of course, Salt Lake City. So he said, you know, he said, well, okay, I wanted, this is the guy to see, because he wanted to see Callie's file and, you know, and so on. Um, so he, uh, uh, he, 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 got, he booked the plane to Salt Lake, called the, uh, the, the, uh, the judge, it was a judge too, um, and said, you know, um, I'm, I'm on my way to San Francisco, um, but my plane is stopping in Salt Lake, which of course in those days no plane stopped in Salt Lake. Um, and I wonder if I could stop in, I'm looking, I'm trying to find out a little bit more about uh, uh, this Cali, you know. And she, he said, okay, so he came in, and then they're sitting together, and while, while the, uh, uh, and, he, and, and the, and the lawyer, judge, you know, Mormon leader pulls out a file, that's Callie's file, and lays it down on the table and, you know, start talking, you know, and then his secretary calls him and there's, uh, you know, so then Hirsch says, okay, now he's out of the room, do you open the file? And, <laughs> and what did he do? And he didn't. No, he didn't. Um, um, but he did say that, you know, uh, he, the, the, the lawyer would not hand him the file. But when he had the file open, okay, he did have, there were some parts of it that could be, could be read. Um, but, and, but, Cal, but, but uh, Hirsch said, you know, one of the things he had learned to do was to read upside down. <laughs> and, and so he was able to pick out a few things. Um, and he said one of the things that, that sort of really blew his mind, you know, was what the charges were. The charge, original charges against Callie were um, for a killing, it was something like, 
I, I don't remember the number, but it was less than 100. It was something like killing 97 Asian human beings. The idea of this separate category called Asian human beings was what really blew his mind and, you know, and that becomes really sort of the driving force. Anyway, he figures out that through, through some amount of guile, but, but the, he figures out that he's at Fort Benning. Now, Fort Benning is the biggest military base. You know, it's, it's about as big as Rhode Island. Um, and uh, then he tells about how he goes to Fort Benning. And, and he, having been in the Army, he knew sort of the behavior of, ar of Army personnel and so on. And he was, you know, he, so at one point he, he's, he, he, he's, he learns that some guy who is in charge of the mail might know where Cali is located. So he's driving in a rented car and he uh, goes to this uh, little um, in this little outpost and he so he drives up and he immediately rides in, you know, moving fast, the car's going fast, pulls right into the commander's uh, 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 parking spot, jumps out, speaking with great authority, hello, uh, where's Callie? Um, but then he said that if ever he was questioned, who are you, what are you, that he, he would have to say that he was a journalist. You know, he could not lie about who he was, you know, but he could bluff, you know. So there are a lot of stories. Then eventually he finds Callie, interviews Callie, and, uh, you know, and that's, that's the only time he gets to interview Callie. You know, and uh, um, he, he, so th th that was all very dramatic. Well, then I also, um, Everett Alvarez, who was the longest prisoner of war, uh, eight and a half years, he was the first person shot down over um, the Gulf of Tonkin um, in the, during the so-called incidents in um, August of 64. Um, and uh, so I've been to Vietnam twice now. And I've been to the, the prison, and they actually have an exhibit um, of, of Alvarez's uh, uniform, at least what they say is his uniform, and a pack of Mar old Marlboro cigarettes, and uh, a few other little things like that. The, uh, the Wahau prison, which actually was originally a French prison, and if you go in there, you know, there, there's a... Um, a, you know, there's a, a picture of, you know, all these prisoners lined up, you know, with their feet shackled, you know, on a long sort of hard bed and so on. Um, much of it has been torn, torn down. Of course, now it's museum and, you know, people go there. Um, and uh, uh, Joanne Malone, who taught at Wilson High School. She was one of the sisters who was involved in uh, the raid on the Dow Chemical, and then they created homemade napalm to burn, to burn uh, some of the Dow records, because Dow was the, creator, was the manufacturer of napalm. Um, and uh, uh, Charlie Litke, who was a uh, Catholic priest, who was awarded the Medal of Honor for saving a bunch of lives, and then he came out and he became an opponent of the war. And later he he re, he 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 returned his medal at the wall, addressed to President Reagan over over the issues in Central America. Um, and uh, <clears throat> let's see. Um, oh, um, uh, what's his name? The guy who was sort of the 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 uh, uh, the subject of Good Morning, Good Morning Vietnam. Uh, oh, um, the radio broadcaster. Uh, yeah. Um, Adam Cronauer or something. Uh, like? Adrian Cronauer. Cronauer. Adrian Cronauer, who is an attorney in D.C. or at least it was. Okay. Um, so you had really interesting people talking, really, you know, key people talking to your students, and they did. You feel the students fully appreciated uh, these people? I think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because you know when I. When I talk to students, you know, um, you know, it, it, years later, I run if I run into students, that's one of the things they remember most. Um, uh, 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 
the speakers, but also the experience of going to the wall and interviewing people. Um, right. That was, uh, because fortunately, um, uh, that period of time falls right around Memorial Day. So that automatically creates, you know, the opportunity to go down to the wall mm. and to, you know, to run into people and, and ask them questions and so on, okay? Um, although just about any time one could go down there, you know, and wait around and you'll find some people. And, you know, and I explained to them, you know, some strategies, you know, you don't ask someone, you know, did you kill anybody, you know, or, or you know, uh, but you, you ask sort of oblique questions like, um, like one was, uh, what was the weather like? Um, were there a lot of insects? Um, you know, things that would sort of, you know, uh, be sort of like a, a roundabout way of getting to a sense of what it was like. Did you have any friends who got injured or hurt or, and so on? That, that might be a way to, uh, to, to bring it out. And if someone says they don't want to talk about it, then you know, you say thank you and, uh, and respect that. Uh, so, I mean, they, they, they got quite a few very, you know, interesting interviews. I, for a while I also did that with grandparents in World War II, something similar like that, you know. Mm -hmm. In one class I actually had two students, uh, literally two students, both of whom had grandfathers on the same ship that was sunk off the Solomon Islands, uh, wow. off uh, um, Guadalcanal uh, in 1942. Mm -hmm. um, and they, I mean, almost everybody survived, but uh, the, two, the two grandparents didn't know each other. Uh, so, well. <clears throat> Yeah. Well, we usually, we usually kind of come to a pause, uh, and I asked the last question, which you've actually already answered. The last question is usually in this interview, how did these early experiences in your life affect the rest of your life? But you've already answered us. You became <laughs> a really master teacher of uh, the, ex the events of the 60s and 70s. I mean, is there anything yeah. else you wanted to add to that or say before we wrap it up? Well, um what it, it certainly, it led me to become um, very focused on educational issues um, and uh, a, a, what I would characterize as what is now going on as sort of an assault on public education. Uh, and and, and, the, and the, the fact that no matter no matter how draconian the policies are that have been instituted primarily against teachers and you know uh, and so on uh, they the, the 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 new management of the school system in DC and also nationally too really has not been able to do much more than simply create new arrangements for um, winnowing and sorting who gets to be, uh, uh, who gets to teach, I mean, who gets to be in what school, you know, so you can have, you know, uh, the more, the more engaged poor parents attracted to a KIPP or this or that, um, and, but, but implicitly they know, and the evidence shows, that those who don't uh, follow the rules according to, you know, the strictness that they want to implement get kicked out. They get kicked out in, you know, they, of course, they don't get formally kicked out. They are, in one way or another, encouraged to withdraw. And, of course, the, the default is always the D.C. public schools. And, and their management has been really terrible in some very good teachers like you know Joe Reiner uh, and uh, Art Siebens and and others and even others who may not have been stellar teachers but who were in many ways a bedrock for uh, students in their communities okay um, who you know paid for food paid for you know uh, or just were a, pl a person that s children could go to uh, a supportive individual in a community center, which is what a school is, at, at least in some sense, um, were just 
casually kicked out because of some arbitrary measure that in the final analysis does not really determine the difference between a good and a bad teacher. Um, and that, so that's, I think it's the gross dishonesty that's behind all of that that continues to motivate me. Um, I mean, in the process, I also expose a number of fraudulent uh, um, alteration of records and so on, um, which is just sort of part of this whole big picture. Uh, I, I overheard in the other interview about the uh, law school um, at UDC, UDC Law School, well, one, one of the, when I, the first time, well, actually both times when I exposed f falsified records at Wilson High School, um, I used a lawyer who was a graduate of the school, um, Doug Hartnett, who was associated with the Government Accountability Project, um, and now, and then went into private practice. Um, so, it, I mean, to be a whistleblower, one has to always, you know, be well prepared and to know what the consequences can be. I mean, for me, I've been, I, I was just very fortunate that things worked out okay. Usually, you know, people get, get uh, uh, fired or, you know, lose their positions quite quickly and then, you know, can't go anywhere else. I mean, um, so that I was, I mean, I was able to survive for 42 years. I mean, that's, uh, of course, I wasn't a whistleblower all of that time, but uh, it is, is unusual. I mean, um, I think Joe just managed to get in the number of years he needed in order to keep his health insurance and so on. I mean, it just, you know, the, the viciousness, and I was explaining this earlier, um, for someone who, you know, ev ev even when you had large numbers of parents who would come, into, come and support you, um, as in the case of Joe and Art Siebens, you know, over 500 parents and former students just ignored, you know. Um, and to think, you know, that uh, Adrian Fenty's mother was formerly a teacher, uh, a special ed teacher at Adams, um, and, uh, that, you know, that uh, she produced a monster. <laughs> <laughs> I think he meant well, but he was wrong. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. You know, I don't even think that anymore, because when I, um, because if, if you mean well, then at some point you're able to sort of look back and to correct a mistake. If you don't, if, if, you, if you can't ever look back and say, and do something to make amends or acknowledge, even simply acknowledge that I, this was wrong, I don't think he ever did that. I mean, he's out selling, you know, uh, um, um, uh, you know, uh, well, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's courting uh, Steve Jobs' wife right now, you know, uh, for his widow and, right. you know, and involved in other, you know, projects yes. to sort of, you know, uh, dismantle public education. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. This is well, thank you. Uh, thank you for <laughs> all your thoughts yeah. and your buttons and your... Yeah.